build a public enterprise, and yet still they make a private enterprise profitable. That validates the point that governments have no business in business. Because when government gets into business, case in point, gun health, it has been having a negative balance sheet for years and years and years, and yet still it's a going concern. June Brew happened to have a negative balance sheet for less than a year. They folded. So we have been beating dead horses for too long, whether it's GPMB, whether it's the cotton mill that's no longer, whether it's the fishing company that was. So now to the reason why I'm here. We want to talk about, um, how do you call it again? Sorry, guys. Economic viability of the 2021 uh, budget. See, everything has a cause and an effect. The cause of the 2021 budget is an effect of the 2017-18 budget. Government decided to have an ambitious infrastructure plan, started with the Banjo Rehabilitation Roads. No means of paying, but means of borrowing through domestic debt. But it wasn't going to stop with one budget cycle. It was going to have a spillover into several budget cycles. And that's why we found ourselves where we are this month, December, when the speaker when the Minister of Finance brought his budget to the Assembly. And matter of fact, it has even gotten worse because you have Nyomi Hakalan and many other roads that are not economically viable nor tenable and yet still politically palatable. Something is fundamentally wrong with all of us, starting with the oversight authority, the Parliament. Nowhere in the world will a parliament rely on the institution they're going to have an oversight on to give them data to validate. It's just like a teacher relying on a student to give him or herself a grade before the teacher grades the grade. It doesn't make sense. But unfortunately, the country we live in, guess what's happening? The parliamentary um, body has been tasked by law to have oversight function, but they don't have the requisite infrastructure to carry out this mandate. So, 2020 budget, as it is, is a spillover of 2018, 2019, and it's going to spell doom in 2021 and beyond. The course of what we have seen in 2018, allowing political expediency to take over economic rationale is costing lives and livelihoods because people are dying in hospitals because we don't have enough and adequate funds to spend in hospitals. Our kids are failing miserably and woefully in their exams and not being equipped with life skills to be productive members of society thanks to poor budgeting. And thanks to selfish politicians who have put self-perpetuation and political expediency over the interests of national development. So 2021 budget should have been a budget that was premised because generally budgets take a cue from what we call the MTEF, Medium Term Expenditure Framework. And the Medium Term Expenditure Framework for 2020 is looking for social expenditures. But 2020 preparing a budget for 2021 should have been a budget that is centered on post-COVID recovery plan. How can the Gambian economy resurrect itself to position itself for relevance in the region we find ourselves? But no, we had a president who is thinking more of electability and he happens to have a cabal who's no interested in your development or that of your kids or subsequent generations of Gambians, but just of one person and one person alone. And that is the presidency. So the cause and effect of the 2021 budget has failed what it was supposed to do. 
the 2021 budget should have been the precursor of putting back the Gambian economy on track. But we have failed on that collectively once again because that budget should have been dead on arrival once it comes to the parliament because that's not what our economy needed nor the people of this country. The people of this country want jobs. The people of this country want um, opportunities. Opportunities and jobs are not availed because of the pandemic. So we needed to stimulate and kickstart our economy. And every expenditure we have made wasn't to kickstart the economy, but rather to help perpetuate someone who shouldn't be perpetuated. So the 2021 budget, as I see it, and as most economists see it, is a fait accompli that's going to put Gambia in a regressive mode. And we are yet to see the effects of the 2020 budget, let alone the budget we want to put in place, because economies generally have a lag effect. Meaning, what happens now doesn't take root immediately. It takes time. And we have seen the Senegambia Hotel retrenching some of their staff. That's the lag effect of what started happening in March, April of this year. Now, I want to ask my members of parliament who are here, how can a country that the president came into the chambers of the assembly during the state opening of parliament and told you guys that the economy will contract by a minimum of 12% for 2020. And yet still they gave you a projection for a budget that is growing faster than the economy can sustain and we happen to live in a tax-based economy. Where is the logic but the parliament should have put the brakes on and said this is not only overly ambitious, but we are leveraging the lives of generations yet unborn. And that is irresponsible and we are not going to be party to. So the complicity of our national government, be it the legislature, executive, I think is collective. There is collective failure in leadership in this country, and we must accept that first, that the legislature and the executive have both failed the people of this country. Because the legislature has accepted to go along with what the executive brought forth. And we all know that what the executive brought forth is not doable, nor is it sustainable. And the Honorable said something here that resonated well with me. We cannot beg our way to prosperity, nor can we borrow our way to prosperity. Prosperity is true salvation and walking. And this country, we don't know how to work. We know how to eat. And the budget, the national budget, has been put in place for us to eat. We will start with the office of the president and the household of the president. How conscionable is the president of this republic to take $150,000 of the lady who is in Sukuta growing salad, the lady who is in Sapo growing rice, the mechanic and the lady selling vegetables at the traffic light who pays GRA a meager sum. Those are the people who are affected by the president spending $150,000 a day. So the cause and effect of this budget is to entrench poverty. The cause and effect of this budget is to increase crime because hopelessness is going to be the way forward for the Gambian. Ill education, not bad. The young Gambian of today is ill-equipped to take over this country because we haven't provided them with life skills. We haven't you know, provided them with the adequate knowledge to be independent human beings to take care of themselves, let alone be meaningful members of society. What can we do? I think that's the answer going forward. The first thing, the parliament need to set up a parliamentary budget office. 
So before the government bring in their document, meaning the executive, that here is our budget, they should be in a position to know the framework of what the budget should be and what the parameters of this economy can sustain in terms of expenditure. Equally, they need to reduce our reliance on taxation and create what you call user fee, non-tax revenue. The non-tax revenue base of this economy hasn't grown over the years. And we cannot tax this economy because we have seen that taxation has an effect. And the effect is today's Gambia. Less than 23% of Gambians pay for 95% of our needs because the informal sector is so big because everyone is avoiding to be captured. What does that mean? People don't have TIN numbers and they don't want to have TIN numbers because they don't want to exist in the system because taxations are excessively high. Two minutes. Taxation is excessively high. So, Parliament can help create that framework by trying to induce the Ministry of Finance to lower the tax rates and broaden the tax base and bring people onto the, into the tax net so that tax distribution in this country can be equitable. If not, you will have few people at GRA who will mediate for their pockets to put monies into their pockets, not into the national coffers. I cannot see a viable Gambia before 2025. One, the global economy is not in our favor because we are exposed to external shocks and these external shocks we have seen that our tourism sector will never thrive when Western Europe is not doing good and Western Europe is not doing good. The petro economies that give us donor funds are not doing good and equally petroleum as a product plays a big role in our economy. And lastly, let us fix our procurement system. If not, Gambia has become free for all where companies like TBEA will give bribes of 700,000 only to get a contract where they have not only been the highest bidder but the difference between their pricing and the next price is over 12 to 13 million. So I hope when that comes for a loan ratification at the parliament, you guys will put your foot down that it was morally and ethically wrong for a company that bribed people to win a contract and moreover their pricing is over 13 billion dollars extra. Thank you so much. All right. <coughs> Thank you so much, um, Mr. Nyangai. Um, I'm hoping that the, parliament, the members of the parliament are listening uh, because some of these uh, solutions goes to the parliament. Uh, you know, uh, that parliament should have a budget office that will look into the budget before it is tabled before the parliament and then increase the loan tax revenue. And I think it's very important. If you look at the trend, it, the loan tax revenue is not going anywhere. And even this year, it, it went down. It, it, it decreases. So I think um, we've seen Kenya, um, you know, these African countries. If you look at Kenya now, they're trying to strengthen their loan tax revenue base and then They've realized uh, a lot of impact when it comes to uh, their, their tax and non-tax revenue. Um, I, I think it's important. If you also increase tax, then it's, it's going to definitely affect uh, the masses. So I think the non-tax revenue is very important. We have to exploit it and make sure um, you know, um, it, it increases because it's not going anywhere, uh, it's, it's decreasing. Thank you so much. Uh, please, I would like you to give a round of applause to um, uh, the panelists. Uh, you know. Now we go into the discussions. Um, I think uh, we have uh, probably, I'll give 30 minutes. Uh, let me see the time, um, if that's possible, um, so that we can have um, you know, a very fruitful discussion um, with the experts, the parliamentarians, and then uh, the uh, our one of our colleagues, uh, which uh, who is Flex down. So um, we can get the questions probably in in sets, like three, three, three. Yeah. Uh, 
So we can start with uh, the first question, Honorable Sao, then Marnyang, not the other, there is another, yeah, there are two mic microphones here, yeah, you can use the two, both. Um, Honorable Sao first, um, Honorable, and then you can direct your questions. Flex, you should be here. Yes, I am. You should be answering questions. Um, yeah, Honorable. Thank you. Uh, mine is more of a short contribution and uh, response to some of the uh, issues raised by various moderators or dissenters. I thank them for uh, making those realistic analysis on the role of parliament and the projects. Uh, it's really unfortunate. Uh, I'm speaking from the parliamentary point of view. Uh, because Parliament is a body that is expected to scrutinize, you know, to represent the interests of the Ghanaian people. But we feel what is in the order to do it when it comes to uh, budget scrutiny, when it comes to uh, our oversight functions. Now, um, this could be attributed to lack of knowledge among us who came to Parliament. Do we really know as parliamentarians what is expected from us? Do you have the knowledge, the skill? You know, it's, it's hard to say because we are at a place where we need to speak the truth and frankly, you understand. Do all of us are at the same level to look at something and say, this is the truth about it and we have to defend it. That's a challenge in that parliament. Two, um, when it comes to issues, we, we all have seen where our individual political parties' interests override the national interests. Or we have instances where an individual interest will override instead of parliamentarians to focus on the job that they have. The other issue is the interference of the office of the clerk in our work. We said we have a new Gambia, but we have the mercenaries. It's just like colonialism. The colonial masters have gone, their mercenaries are here working, and we have the same colonial system happening. Physically, we are not with the chains, but our minds are still with the chain. If you look at what is happening in the parliament, how can we be controlled, in fact, with the parliamentary sessions? What are we doing? We have, uh, you talk about the audit reports of 2016. What did parliament do about it? It's still lying down there. So the programs in the parliament cannot help us to do our job. Coming to the interference of the uh, office of the speaker, you, co you, you, you have been seeing it. Where the speakers you know, will, will see themselves as demigods. They will not allow people's representatives to communicate. This is what is happening in the Gambia. And that's the hard fact. We are not the target. And I don't want Gambians to think that we can make the change that we are yearning for. We are out of it. You people come next and make change. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Honorable. Thank you for that uh, insight. Um, Mar Nyang, uh, I think that's a comment. Mar, Mar Nyang. Basically, I think what I wanted to say was uh, it has already been said by Honorable Mr. Honda, but in response to Honorable um, Siri Yata regarding the need for us to have a body report. I think um, one, of, one of the things um, that I was trying to raised here is during the audit, the National Audit Office, to be honest, in 2016, they have found a lot of irregularities that the government of the Gambia has been doing. Like, for example, the failure to disclose government funds that are being held in other um, commercial banks. Government has been having millions, almost, um, there is 164 million in one bank, 92,000 pounds in other, uh, euros in another bank, 118,000 euros and in another bank, 1.4 million um, dollars in another bank that has not been disclosed in the financial statement that has been identified by the National Audit Office. So I believe the work of the National Audit Office um, is really important. But the problem is, once it goes to Parliament, um, the Constitution, I believe, in Section 160 is clear about what should be done. Um, once the, the, the National Audit Office presents the audit report to Parliament, it has been discussed six months after the end of the fiscal year, it should be published. And then, I believe section 160, subsection 2, 5, I believe, also talk about once the National Audit Office um, identifies 
fraudulent activities during the fiscal year, they should report it to the Inspector General of Police. And the National Audit Office will tell you they have reports that they have sent to the IGP for them to investigate, but they are in action regarding this particular fraudulent reports that are with the executive. If I can put it that way, because the IGP is under the executive. So there has not been actions that have been taken, and I believe this is one of the things that has to be, I mean, pushed from the parliament. To ensure, once the, I mean, not only that uh, this is the, the, the report, there are also special audits like that of the Simlex report, I believe. The National Audit Office did a report on that. I mean, they have identified massive uh, maladministration. And it's, it's not, um, the government is not oblivious to the fact that these issues are still outstanding. You look at the Gambian uh, consulate in UK, there is an audit report that um, identifies massive maladministration. What did they do? Redeployment or relief. You understand? So accountability after the audit report is what is lacking. And I believe the parliament should push to ensure that the, uh, once these reports are given to the IGP, they investigate. And then also, once it is tabled at the parliament, I believe one of the things that the parliament should do is to discuss and consider those reports for it to be published. So that us, the civil society organizations, yeah. um, we will... Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to... Are you pre preempting the next session? No, I, no yeah, I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm connecting, connecting it to the... Um, yeah, I understand, um, you know, you are preempting. It, it's good that you no, raise this No, um, just, just, just hear me out. Okay. Because there is also another report called the Anson Young Audit Report that was given to, I believe, a UK audit firm. Massive maladministration identified in the seven SOEs, no action. Okay. You understand? So I believe these audits are going on, but I mean, the, the accountability and is really like So that's what I wanted to identify basically. So I also agree with you that the audits should be on time and the reports should be published on time so that we will not have backlog of reports outstanding, um, you know, where key recommendations have been reported. All right, uh, we take few calls. Um, let's take ladies. Um, uh, first, uh, Tuma and then Akitabu. Yes, quickly, please. Um, I, I just to add on to what Ma said. I yeah. think if things have been declared, for example, there was a statement that the Minister of Health made on the floor of the Parliament of, uh, about malpractice, malpractice within his ministry, and also the Minister of um, Education also stated that there were no funds allocated from the um, COVID funds towards the Ministry of Education, that all the support they had were from the international supporters, and I think Parliament should have picked up that and d um, do a thorough investigation. Uh, yeah, that was an addition. Oh, okay. Um, sorry. Uh, please, can we stick to the questions, please, uh, you know, so that we can... We can, we can, uh, we have the panel, uh, panel here, and uh, please remember we are having another session on transparency uh, on the budget process, so uh, as well as the implementation. So please, let's stick to the question. Anti Tabu, uh, and then I give you a chance to maybe Anti Tabu and Wabu Kanyang, then uh, Derba, and then we give the chance uh, for the panel, and then Honorable. My honorable, I was not forgetting. <laughs> yeah, Aunt Tabu, uh, please, precise. Okay, thank you very much, um, and good morning to everyone. I just want to ask the um, honorable member um, a question. I know in the, in the parliament, there are select committees. And in the select committees, I think you are required to have a specialist in that committee. So do you have one? In the public accounts committee so that the person can help you so in case the budget comes to at least look at it before it is tabled at the national assembly so that all, all issues that you're raising here can be can be taken care of and then when the minister comes you will have substantive questions to ask so that the budget that is stable. Can 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 be remedied. All right. Uh, that's a question for, to uh, uh, Honourable Demba. Give Demba, and then uh, we go to Demba. Honor, uh, Demba. Demba, you can take Demba. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Demba Balde from Guyanaco, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have two questions, and then uh, before you answer the questions, I'll have a comment to make okay. because I may leave, have to leave before the end of the program. Uh, my question goes to Nyang Jai and then yourself. 
um, who is chair in the organization. All right, thank you. Nyang, you talked about non-tax revenue. If you could kindly give examples of non-tax revenue, because sometimes people don't know what you're talking about. And then uh, to the organizers of this organization, uh, this program, I want to find out how you can engage the diaspora, the Gambian diaspora, um, to make sure that this is a viable uh, organization. Because okay. I had talked to a few people about this, um, this coalition. And I can tell you that no government would ever respond to the needs of its citizens without citizens organizing themselves and demanding accountability. This is a coalition. If you engage, if you organize, you find funding, resources, you organize a paid staff, listen, we can all volunteer for our country. But before you can volunteer effectively, you have something to put on the table for your family and for yourself. So create a paid staff that will, volunteer, that will run this organization as a coalition. And we organize grassroots across the country, everywhere. And I say to everybody, I see great potentials in this country. Just great potential. Just by coming back here once in a while, I see great potentials that are on top. Thank you. This country has great potential. But there is also a difference. This country is not poor. This country is poorly managed. It is poorly led. Everybody is complaining from the president all the way down. But very few people are doing something about it to make it to change the status quo. and making sure we change it. Every Gambian must see in him or herself in the child or the woman that is loitering in the streets and begging. When the president have his meetings in the provinces, in Mahmoud Fana and other places, 